Well, Eric, yesterday you gave a sermon. I think that is so applicable to the times in which we live. In fact, that was the whole message. <laughs> uh, but your sermon was called As the Sons of Issachar. Is that right? Yeah, you did good. Uh, yeah, Excellent. Yeah, yeah it's Great better than the there. one from a few weeks ago. <laughs> Uh, could you just give a quick overview of just that message and just kind of your heart behind why you felt well, led the, to sub, give it? the subtitle of the message is sort of the giveaway for it, and that is understanding the times in which we live. I think uh, in referencing back to that statement in Chronicles, where it's it's talking, David's sort of seen in unpacking his uh, military force now that he's the king over all of Israel, and so all of the tribes are sort of coming before him and being numbered and. Uh, it says of the sons of Issachar that they were uh, men that understood the times in which they lived and knew what Israel ought to do. And I think for many of us, what we feel is a question mark. What am I supposed to be doing right now? What is the church supposed to be doing? Uh, how am I supposed to respond to this? I see a crumbling culture. What is my role in this? And I know that this is my burden. I had a father-son gathering uh, last night, and this was, again, the discussion. This is a huge thing for men. What are we supposed to be doing right now? What is our task? And so that's why it's like we need the sons of Issachar right now. They seem to understand the times in which they lived, and they knew what Israel ought to do. Do we have the sons of Issachar in our midst? And so I think that's the, the baseline tension that we're facing. I believe— very strongly, that God desires to give us understanding of the times in which we live. But we also need to realize the times in which we live are changing so dramatically that the way we used to engage this culture needs to adapt. And that's part of the tension I, uh, as well that we are facing is many of us are sort of the old stodgy, uh, old-fashioned guard. We like it the way it's always been. And so the real reason we're upset with what's happening isn't because darkness has taken an upper hand. It's because our lives are being inconvenienced, and that's where we need to change. And that's part of what we wanted to talk about today. That's really good. If, if you haven't listened to that message, I'd really encourage you to go back and listen to it. You can find that at ellersley.com and go to the sermons tab and search for as this as I just lost as it the as the sons, sons of, of Issachar. <laughs> <laughs> I always like to pick titles that create problems. Man, for you. it is that is yeah. true. Uh, or if you're listening this week, you can go to ellersley.com forward slash daily, where you can get all these uh, weekly discussions as well as the sermon. Uh, this week, Eric, we were just kind of talking about how helpful it would be to even break that down a little bit more specifically and give some strategies of, okay, maybe not so much of like, how do you determine the times in which we live? In other words, we, we need God's spirit yeah. and insight to breathe upon us and give us clarity for the times mm -hmm. in which we live. But there are certain things that we know we are called to do in this season. In yeah. other words, we, we may be in a fog in terms of culture and society mm -hmm. and, and how do you handle specific mm -hmm. issues, yeah. but we do know certain things that mm -hmm. we are called to yeah. to do in this in this time. So today's episode is called The Strategy of Relinquishment. Mm -hmm. uh, would you explain what that means? It's interesting. I It's one of the most common exhortations I'm going to give to someone is to let go even the good things that are in their hand. And God seems to walk us through this as a starting point. Like if, if I want to just sort of clear the decks and get a fresh vision for where I'm going, what am I here on earth for, God? Why, why am I here again? What am I doing? It's to let go of all that I am doing, not in the sense of, hey, I'm forsaking it, I'm, I'm leaving town, uh, but to freshly set it in God's hands. And we have a tendency to struggle with that because we're like, well, what's he going to do with it? And that's the point. The reason it's important is to say, God, I trust you. Mm -hmm. I trust that if it's not your design, I'm wasting my time. Unless the Lord builds the house, I'm laboring in vain. So God, I'm going to take these precious things and I'm going to set them all back in your hands. In ministry lingo, it's oftentimes called the death of a vision. And it's it's a reference back and many people that, that are in ministry understand this idea of the death of the vision, where oftentimes you'll get an initial vision for changing the world and to share Jesus with the world. And so you'll put a tremendous amount of effort and prayer and, and givenness to it and uh, sweat and sacrifice. And then God will bring you to a place where something happens that makes it seem like it's impossible. And you have to wrestle through that. It's like, God, I thought you gave this to me. And in a sense, the best strategy in that point is to give it to God, not to throw it out, to entrust it to God. Isaac is being given to God. That's what a sacrifice is. 
And so Abraham is being tested to say, you know, I gave you Isaac, and Isaac's a good thing. And through Isaac, I'm going to uh, bring forth descendants as numerous as the stars in the heaven and the sands on the seashore. So there's even promise associated with Isaac. So why would God take Isaac? And that's why Abraham, it says in the New Testament, Abraham believed God. He knew that God could bring back Isaac from the dead because obviously it's through Isaac that his seed is going to be called. So how's this supposed to work? Well, Abraham doesn't know, but he does know he needs to give up Isaac to God. And that's that death of a vision that I've walked through many times. Uh, even before Ellerslie started, I still remember a, it was like a breakfast or a lunch. I'm sitting across the table from this one man and he says, uh, maybe you're holding on to it too tight. And I'm thinking, who is this guy to give me a lecture on holding on to things too tight? I've given this thing to God so many times. <laughs> and yet, I, even as I was sitting there, I'm thinking, that's exactly what I needed to hear. Lord, here it is. And before Ellers started, I gave it up, fully expecting it not to work. And that's the key point that many of us need to be brought to. I shouldn't say many of us. All of us need to be brought to in the different aspects of our life to let God freshly have the position of Lord and Master, which means he could take it. And that's a very real possibility that if you give something to him, he needs to be able to take it. So many people that are in a relationship, and they come to me, hey, Eric, could you give me some relational advice? Give it back to God. It's like, What? That's not what I was looking for. I was looking for how I could win her heart or how I could, you know, woo her or how I could propose really creatively. Give it back to God. Let him have it. And if you're holding it, it doesn't turn out well. But if he's holding it, wow, this can work. Such a beautiful thought that, and I think God is consistently asking us to surrender things. In other words, mm -hmm. even the things that he is, in, as you, as you just said, he's given us passions and desires for, it's like a lot of times he'll tarry purposely, it seems like, so that he can actually test whether or not we are trying to control yeah. or whether it's surrendered. I, if, you, if you even expand this to a more of a, from a personal to a global or a, or a corporate level, mm -hmm. it's interesting that I think so oftentimes we, as a body of Christ, are trying to hold on to what God did five years ago or 10 yeah. years ago and say, well, because God moved like that, yeah. he's going to have to move like this. Well, God yeah. spoke in a bush to Moses back in the day. So why, why aren't, why isn't this bush in flank? Of course, if it did, I'd probably scream and, you know, <laughs> I have a problem. <clears throat> but, but, why, but why aren't we having bushes speak today? Yeah. And yet we got to recognize that it's not that the bush was wrong. Wasn't, yeah. It was that it was bad. That's, that was God's means. He's wanting to do something fresh yeah. today. And I think a lot of times from a corporate level, the truth never changes. Mm -hmm. But the way that we communicate truth has to change for the days in which we live. Yeah. And if I'm trying to hold on to whatever this was back then, it probably is not going to be effective. And I love how God has moved people throughout history to do what seemed wild and crazy. Like mm -hmm. you take the Salvation Army, yeah. uh, brass bands was a little bonkers in the church of that day. I mean, that you don't do that. Yeah. Or the old hymns that we now love and cherish yeah. were a lot of them were written off of bar tunes, <laughs> which was scandalous <laughs> in the day when they were written. So it's like, you know, how dare we sing hymns? Because they're and yet it's interesting that, you know, the moment you try to close your fist on what God has given or yeah. what you think God is doing, uh, a lot of times you're missing actually what he needs, what he wants to do That's today. Right. And I think with the quickness of culture, we we never sacrifice the truth, yeah. but we must be willing to sacrifice the means or the form. And just as a quick illustration, my, one of my favorite illustrations of this is I heard a story years ago about this woman, she was I think probably in her 70s or 80s, and a little small church. And she began to recognize that all these teenagers were living in the housing uh, area around the church, <clears throat> but not a single one of them were coming to church. Mm -hmm. And she went up to the pastor and just said, pastor, I just, I'm so burdened for these teenagers. I, I will do whatever it takes uh, for these teenagers to come and hear the gospel. And so she says, is there any way she goes, I love the old hymns. I love the old music. Can we give that up and start doing praise choruses? And she goes, I'm even willing to learn the electric guitar if that's what will bring them in. <laughs> and so here's this cute old lady who learned the electric guitar in her, you know, in her old age, just so that she'd be on the platform strumming along, just so that it would at least appeal. Yeah. And it's a cheesy illustration, perhaps, but I love that heart that that woman just had that was just like, Lord, I'm willing to, I'm willing to lay down my rights. I'm willing to lay down my comfort. I'm willing to lay down my preferences mm -hmm. for the sake of the kingdom of God. I think that's so necessary in this idea of relinquishment of we're not called to a, a pampered, uh, self-pleasing lifestyle as a Christian. 
which I actually think is why persecution is helpful for the church because mm-hmm. you're not you're never comfortable. And yet we in America or the Western culture have had such comfort at the time. It's, it's hard for us to relinquish that which we've had. Absolutely. I think even the landscape of scripture is based upon a shift. And those that accepted the shift into the new covenant, which would be a big shift, that's an entire cultural kingdom shift uh, for the nation of Israel, the Jews at the time. And for those that were willing to let go of the previous way, and embrace the new way, which includes Gentiles coming in. I, that, that is so preposterous to a Jewish mind. I mean, they could not hardly swallow it. And that was, of course, some of the great friction in the beginning. Well, we should have these Gentiles be circumcised. We should put them under the law. And that's what the Council of Jerusalem is. It's like, hey, guys, are we willing to change where God has changed? Because the Jewish law is righteousness. It's a picture of holiness and set apartness. It's good. And yet there was something new that God was doing. And so that's the entire landscape of scripture even. And if you don't know about that change, and you just go to the Old Testament and don't recognize that we live in a different time, it could actually put you in bondage. And a lot of people have struggled with that. We need to know the times in which we live. We're in the new covenant. And the same is true like in America, corporately right now, just like you said, we are we are struggling to adapt. The world is changing so dramatically fast. And yet we are wanting to hold on to the way we've always done it. And it doesn't mean that the way we've always done it is bad. Right. It's just that, are we willing to do what is necessary to be in stride with God? Could you imagine if you were in the uh, wilderness and the people of Israel were following a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night? But so... They get a nice spot and the tabernacle is set up and it's like, you know what? I really like this spot. This has a good view. This, you know, there's some, uh, I like how the manna comes down in this one area. And it's just, a, it's a really nice, I like the breeze that comes through. It's just a really nice spot. And you get sort of settled in there and you get your traditions and your spot, your daily routine. You get up and you walk around this one rock and you're feeling really good. And then the cloud moves. God, I don't want to go anymore. I want to stay here. And that's the way many of us in in America are right now in the church. It's like, this is the way I want my church. This is the way I want to interact with God. This is the way I want to sing my songs to God. This is the way it needs to happen. And God's saying, but what if I wanted to bring about a great revival, but I need you to follow me into this new territory, this new way of doing it. Would we be willing to go? And that's a letting go. That's a relinquishment. And that's on the individual level, and on the corporate level, I think what God is touching on right now, and that's that's why we're even discussing it. That's good. Could you give that illustration of Corey Tim Boom mm-hmm. uh, on the train? Because I think that's a great, or just a reminder for all of us of what we, we even may see as a negative thing. Yeah. If we would just lay down, God can do some extreme powerful things yeah. through it. Now, you know, back in World War II, Germany was not healthy. So I, I'm German. So I just want to sort of get that out on the table that we're going to liken Germany to a very evil location. <laughs> it's not right now. You could go to Germany. I'm sure it'd be very pleasant. But at that time, no one wanted to go to Germany. If you were Dutch and you were a Christian or a Jew, you wouldn't want to be in Germany. And so, and that's uh, largely bigger part in large part, because that's where the major concentration camps were and all the death right. camps and all that kind that's of stuff. Right. Yeah. And it was, it was scary, scary stuff. So Corey Ten Boom and her family had helped the Jews. Uh, they had hid the Jews, and they were caught. They were found out. They were arrested. They were stuck into Dutch prisons, which was really hard. I mean, it wasn't easy being in a prison. Uh, for serving Jesus, they're in prison. And yet, Corey had one prayer over and over and over again. Lord, not Germany. Just I'll stay in a Dutch prison. I'm fine there, but just don't take me to Germany. And so this critical moment, she's on one of those cattle cars, they're stuffed in, and she's looking out through one of the slats, you know, in the the side through the planks, and she sees the border for Germany. And it would seem as if God had failed her. It would seem as if God had not listened to her. And I think one of the most profound stories maybe in my life, I mean, it ranks right near the top, is this, this story. Because I think in many ways, I've had moments in my life where I have made it clear. It's like, God, just not Germany. You know, I I, want to radically serve you, just not Germany, (laughs) whatever that would be the equivalent in my life. And then the next thing you know, I'm in Germany. (laughs) 
And it's hard. You sort of swim in your little uh, wobbly need. And there's the way that she talks about it in the book, Tramp for the Lord, has had a great impact on my life. And if I could enunciate it as simply as possible, she's like, God knew that I needed to be in Germany to fulfill the calling on my life. And what the calling of my life stems from is me coming to God and saying, God, you can take me wherever you want to take me. You can do with me whatever you want to do with me. I am yours. God's answering a bigger prayer, a prayer before her not Germany prayer. And if he, he were to answer her not Germany prayer, he's basically canceling out the answer to his, his answer to her previous prayer, which is God do with me what you put me on earth to do. And he has a design for Corey. And because she was in Germany, she changed my life. It's because she was in Germany right. that my life is impacted. And she recognized that, that God is turning what the enemy has meant for evil into a profound platform to share the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so for her to freshly relinquish her demand of God not to bring her to Germany, but to instead say, God, I accept your plan because I genuinely do want my life to fulfill its purpose. I don't want to define my purpose. I want you to define my purpose. So Lord, I'm going to let go of that demand to say, you can do everything with me, but just not this. No, I'm actually going to say, even that I'm yours. Oh, I love that story. It's so powerful. I think just in closing, I just want to maybe even reiterate that just as a commission to those who are listening, what would it look like if we freshly found ourselves at the foot of the cross in humility and just said, Lord, uh, however you want to use this body, you know, spill and spin this body for your king and for your kingdom, for the, for the king and for the kingdom. Lord, what would it look like to remove me out of my own comfort and out, out of my own preferences and it's not a relinquishing of truth. Again, I think it's an embrace mm -hmm. of the truth. But it's say, Lord, if you want to do something crazy through my life for the sake of the truth and for the sake of the kingdom and so you can turn this world upside down once again, I'm willing. And I think that's so important, I think, for all of us uh, to come and relinquish all that we've been holding on to uh, so that he can fully use our lives uh, in the days in which we live. Amen.